have you ever experienced ice fog or freezing fog before? It's a lot different than just regular old fog. It's also pretty damn rare. It has to be very, very cold and very humid outside for it to even occur. But when it does, it's usually a lot thicker and harder to see through than regular fog is. Freezing fog is not as bad as ice fog though, since it's still a liquid and doesn't completely freeze solid. It can still be very difficult to navigate through though, if you just so happen to be out and about in it. When this story happened, it wasn't as easy to get weather forecasts as it is now. Although the temperature didn't fluctuate as much as it seems to nowadays, it still would occasionally, so it was not an unheard of experience to get caught in bad weather simply because you hadn't been informed. I was a teenager when this story happened. I was over at my cousin's house and we were playing Nintendo games all day and well into the night as well. Before I'd even realized it had already gotten pretty late and I knew I had to start heading on my way home. We lived out in the country, more or less. We lived in old family homes that had been passed down from generation to generation, which is pretty common in my country. That's just like cold weather is very common in my country too. Normally though, if I was over at my cousin's house, I would ride my bike home after we got done. On this night though, I didn't feel safe riding my bike. When I went out the door and saw that thick freezing fog, I didn't feel safe navigating my bike home in that. I decided it made more sense to walk home with my bike in tow. It was pretty unlikely I would come across a car or anything out on that old road, but if an animal were to come out in front of me, I could at least scare them away with my bike and not have to risk running into them while riding. I left to walk home to my own house. It had to be sometime past midnight if I recall correctly. Now, when you think country, we didn't live in an area that was surrounded by gigantic thick trees or anything like that. It would actually be probably more what you'd refer to as a moorland. It was a hilly area that didn't really have a lot of vegetation, just some grass and some shrubs here and there. There were also very few houses about in this area. You could look out across the entire moorland during the daytime and likely not see any buildings at all. Basically, it was a very barren and quiet area. There wasn't a lot I could see as I was walking. The moon was not particularly bright that night, as far as I could tell, so I could only see so much as I was walking around. This gave the walk a completely different ambiance than normal. I had never been so nervous walking home before in the dark. There was just something about that fog in that night. I'm not sure if it was the sounds or lack of sound in the air, the lack of visuals or maybe some hidden sense beyond those things, but I could tell that something was not feeling right. I had even walked home before while my bike was broken, but I wasn't really sure how long it would take me to make this time. I was so used to riding my bike all the time. This night, everything seemed to be going at a snail's pace. Something about this atmosphere was so weird. It was quiet, dark, and cold outside. I could almost feel the fog on me. I began wondering how much colder it would have to get to start to turn into ice crystals. I had experienced it before, and that would make things even harder. I was walking along the side of the road at this point, which had iced up pretty badly too. There was another good reason to not be riding my bicycle in the dark that night. Suddenly though, as I was walking along, I began to hear this sound. It was coming from right in front of me, but because it was so quiet outside, I couldn't exactly tell how far away it was. It was definitely the sound of someone else walking down the road too though. I could hear their footsteps tapping. Normally, if I had seen someone walking down the road, I wouldn't give it that much thought, even this late at night. I would simply give them a wave once I saw them and we'd go our separate ways. I don't know if it was because of the atmosphere or because of the weather conditions this night, but something felt really off about this to me. I had no real reason to feel fear or apprehension, 
but I began feeling it nonetheless. I was able to hear the tipping and tapping getting louder and louder as the other walker and I began approaching each other. I felt myself getting more and more nervous, probably because I couldn't even see this person yet. I squinted off into the darkness to try and see if I could make out something coming towards me. However, at no point yet had I been able to see anything. That was when the strangest thing happened. I had been hearing the tipping and tapping of those steps for quite a while at that point, when suddenly they stopped altogether. I thought at first that whoever had been walking towards me must have just stopped for a moment. Still, as I walked forward though, I didn't come across anyone, and I didn't hear the walking noises start up either. Honestly, I was just confused. I kept thinking I was right about to come across someone just appearing from the darkness. I tried to forget about it and just keep on my way best I could. I wanted to get home as quickly as possible. I wanted to get out of this creepy atmosphere and jump back into my bed. This night was way too weird. I'm not sure how much time had passed without me hearing anything. It was really dead quiet outside. I almost began wishing I could hear the tipping and tapping of the walking come back. It seemed like just shortly after I thought that, I actually did hear a tapping, walking sound on the road, only this time it was right behind me. Before I had a chance to react at all, I felt something suddenly touch my shoulder. I jumped forward in surprise, almost dropping my bicycle on the ground. I was able to turn around though and see something I never expected. I saw a human arm extending towards me in the fog. The fog was so thick that that was all I could see though. Whoever the arm belonged to, they were completely enveloped in the fog around us. I didn't have much time to think. I only had time to react, and so I did something I hadn't expected to do. I immediately jumped onto my bicycle. Even though I had almost no visibility and the road was coated in ice, I didn't care at this point. I began riding the bicycle as fast as I could, booking it to get home. I almost took a bad spill many times, but I didn't wait for anything and I didn't look back even once. I just kept riding as hard as I can until I got all the way home. When I did arrive home, I dropped my bicycle at the door and ran inside. I locked the door and sprinted to my room, locking that door too. It wasn't until I was in my bed that I had a few moments to put everything together in my mind. Whoever had been walking toward me on the road had obviously stepped off to the side at some point. They'd kept out of sight distance and come up from behind me to try and grab me from behind. I can only assume this person's intentions were not good. Why else would they have snuck up behind me like they had? I don't know who it was or what it was all about, but I've often seen that arm in my dreams since then, reaching out to grab me from out of that dark and thick fog. To preface this post, I grew up in an upper middle class family. My dad was a young professional, and my mom was next level taking care of three kids and being a GM for my dad. Shit completely hit the fan and they divorced. At this point in time, I was in junior high, grade 7 or 8 I believe, and had recently gotten bus privileges. I was busing to school back and forth on my own with no issues. Being an independent teacher, I thought I was giving my mom a good break, especially since she was a single mom with three kids. Now, the bus picked me up and dropped me off at the exact same spot every time, an intersection on a main road, which intersected with my residential road. It was literally only a one-minute walk over to my house. Growing up, my mom had instilled to us the fears of stranger danger. Yet, despite that, I'd led a fairly sheltered life up to that point. I was overall a very talkative and nice kid. I could strike up a conversation with anybody, and usually my guard wasn't really up per se. I tended to just trust everyone, even if I'd just met them for the very first time. 
On this fateful late afternoon, the bus dropped me off at the usual spot. I was minding my own business, walking toward my side street, when suddenly I heard the voice of a woman calling out to me. Little boy, it's cold outside! I turned around and that's when I saw a white cargo van. There was a woman practically leaning out the car window. She was dressed rather nice, all black, fairly young, big nice smile. The cargo van doors then completely swung open and she was leaning out of them. I strongly believe in a sixth sense your gut, intuition, whatever you want to call it. And in this instant, my gut was telling me to get out of there right now, to walk faster and create some distance from this person. It's so cold outside, isn't it? Let us drive you over to your house. No, it's fine. My house is just down the street. I pointed over in that direction. She was very persistent, though. The van sped up and slowed down next to me, and she leaned out further. I was practically walking on the gravel to avoid her at this point. She kept on talking to me, but I was no longer listening to what she was saying. I wanted to get a better look. I wanted to see what she was trying to hide inside that cargo van. You see, she was leaning in a very weird way, in which she was obstructing my view of what was inside. As I walked, she kept on shifting. I managed to sprint just fast enough to get ahead of her. And that's when I saw him. There was a man crouched down behind her just out of view. I remember seeing his body. He was tensed and ready to pounce. When I saw him, that's when everything sank in. These people were trying to grab me. I'll never forget the face that woman made. She went from a cheerful and happy smile to instantly sour and aggravated. She dropped her acting right away and slammed the door. Then they sped off. As an adult, I'm convinced this was a planned act of opportunity. Around that time, we had a series of kidnappings in my city and town. All kids my age, reportedly by the same white cargo van. In this instance, they'd followed a bus and just waited for the perfect moment to strike. I could have very easily been one of those missing kids on a milk box. I still get chills when I think about it to this day. In my early 20s, I landed a receptionist job in a sales office at a manufactured housing community. It was my first office job after working in daycare and the food and drink industry. Honestly, I was really excited. I greeted potential buyers, set up appointments, and staged the spec homes with our stock of furniture and decorations. I worked with one other person in the office, who was the salesman. When he was out, I took potential buyers through our spec homes and gathered their information for follow-up. I was working alone one day when a customer came into the office looking to potentially purchase his first home. I gathered some information from this young man and asked if he would like to take a look at some spec homes. As we walked down the sidewalk towards the row of homes, we chatted about the various floor plans and finishes available. I knew the product information and had no trouble confidently answering his questions. He was friendly and honestly reminded me of a classmate I knew from high school that had played offense on the football team. I decided to show him the two home models that best fit his price range and desired floor plan. Since I'd shared most of the technical information during the first home tour, I gave him some space to freely look around the second home. He walked through the main living area and stopped in the doorway to one of the back bedrooms. He called out to me. Hey, what's this back here? He pointed to the corner of the room. I couldn't see anything in there from where I was standing. I knew these floor plans by heart, so I politely answered that it was a closet. In my mind, I was sarcastically thinking, really, you don't know what a closet is? The man chuckled and asked again. No, really, come here. What's this in the closet back here? I could tell by his tone he really wanted me to come see for myself. 
He motioned for me to come closer and take a look. His tone was friendly, but his request didn't make much sense. I paused, a bit confused. In that split second, something shifted. Maybe it was the energy in the air, but the hairs on my neck were now standing straight up. The way he was looking at me changed right in front of me. I suddenly sensed that something was off here. I did not feel safe any longer. With all the light-heartedness I could muster, I repeated to him, Oh, that's just a closet. Excuse me for a moment, I need to go check on something outside. I quickly made my exit to the sidewalk outside the house. I had no concrete reason for why I felt the overwhelming need to leave that house immediately. I didn't understand why my body sensed so much danger. I just knew I needed to get away from there. Over the next few days, the young man came back to the office to meet with the salesman. He filled out all the various paperwork needed to purchase a home and live within the community. He dropped by several more times unannounced to check on his application status. If I wasn't there, he would ask the salesman when I worked next, though. My coworker just thought I had a not-so-secret admirer. I couldn't shake the overwhelming feeling, though, that something was wrong with this guy. On nights I worked alone, I locked the office door from then on. A few days later, corporate sent back their analysis of this young man's application and the completed background check. He had been denied. The background check revealed multiple social assault and rear convictions. And there it was, crystal clear, undeniable, 2020 hindsight. The salesman called the customer right away to let him know the application had been denied and we would do nothing further for him. A few days later, the young man decided to come back to the office one more time. When my co-worker saw the young man's vehicle turn into our parking lot, he told me to go to the back room of the office, where I could hide out of sight. Just like the times before, the young man entered the office and asked if I was working that day. This time, though, he was met by a very angry large salesman that had nothing to lose. I had never heard my coworker raise his voice before, but on that day, his voice was angry as the heavens. Needless to say, the young man never came by again, and I wasn't scheduled to work alone nearly as often. I was always left with a lot of responsibility when I was a kid. I was the oldest of four children, and even from a really young age, I had to be responsible for all of my siblings. I was babysitting them when I was young enough to need a babysitter myself. However, my parents always insisted I knew better, and that I had to be responsible for all the other children, basically whenever they didn't want to be. We lived in an old house out in the hills for my entire childhood. We had one car, which we had for years and years that I remember. It was old and probably not the best vehicle to be driving around in bad weather. That meant if my parents were out, they wouldn't always come home if the weather was too bad. It wasn't unusual that I would be home alone with the other kids overnight, and sometimes even longer. This happened one winter when I was about 12 years old. My parents had gone over to some relative's house to hang out, drink, and do that sort of thing. I can't recall who it was, but that's not the part of the story that matters. This was the sort of thing that the adults in my family did every weekend before driving home likely very drunk. I was at home with the other kids and I had to prepare dinner for them and keep them all entertained. Luckily, it was a Friday night, so I didn't have to worry about getting them in bed too early. The kids all liked staying up late on a Friday night and watching some Johnny Carson before bedtime. My parents weren't home when the school bus dropped us off. There was a note on the fridge to contact the Meeks family down the street if anything were to happen. They were a bit of a ways up the hill from us, though, so we really didn't ever contact them for any reason. As I mentioned before, I was supposed to know better and thus be able to take care of all the others no matter what happened. It began snowing not long after we got home. 
It seemed light at first, and like it might not stick, but I was sure wrong about that. The snow began falling pretty heavily, and it definitely was sticking. It began to pile up pretty quickly. It wasn't long until I got the call from the parents, letting us know they would be staying the night over at the relative's house. They had been drinking too much, and it would be even more dangerous than usual to drive up. No big deal. I was expecting this to happen anyway. I put the two younger children to bed after Johnny Carson and let my 10-year-old brother stay up with me. Honestly, I didn't want to be up by myself, and he and I always got along very well. I don't know if this is just in retrospect due to what else happened that night, but I recall this really creepy feeling that I couldn't identify for some reason. It made me feel much safer to have someone else up with me. I kept on getting up and checking the weather, the front window looked out onto the yard, but it was hard to see much looking out there right now. We had a light on the front porch, which we always had to leave on when we were home alone, but the snow was so thick that we couldn't see anything out there. It was way too thick. It was pretty late, and my brother and I were up later than we usually would have tried to stay away. There were some Christmas specials on TV, and although the reception wasn't so good, it wasn't something we noticed back then. All TV that far out in the country got some real fuzzy reception. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we heard this loud crashing noise. The couch we were sitting on was up against the same wall as the window. We had to turn around in order to see that the window had just been busted open. The scariest part, though, was that we noticed an arm coming through the broken open window. That terrified us both, and we jumped off the couch in a hurry. My little brother jumped and ran out of the room faster than I could have imagined. I don't blame him, though. I was 12 years old and terrified. I could only imagine how scared a 10-year-old would be. He was also much faster than I was at getting out of that room. I got off the couch and looked back at the window, wondering what it was that I was supposed to do. I saw a guy I didn't recognize looking in. He saw me standing there and looked surprised to see me. Looking back, I think he may have thought no one was home because of there being no vehicle in the driveway. It didn't make sense he would be trying to rob this house out in the middle of nowhere, though. At least it didn't make much sense to me at the time. If he were a robber, I guess it's possible he thought it would take much longer for the police to arrive. My little brother ran into the room with my dad's rifle, surprising me because I thought he wasn't going to come back. We were all taught to shoot at a very young age, so I guess I can understand why he went after the gun. I thought he would be found hiding under the bed or in the closet. The guy standing in the window saw that gun and immediately retreated backward. I ran over to the door and looked out through it. Although it was hard to see what was happening due to the falling snow, I could see the man retreating into it. It only took a few moments, though, before he was completely lost in the torrent of falling snow. We did our best to cover up the window, but we were mostly just worried about whether the man was going to come back and try another entrance or something. My brother and I went around to make sure the doors and windows were all locked. Then we sat together on the couch in fear of that guy coming back. We kept the rifle right by us, and eventually both fell asleep on the couch together. The guy never did come back. The following morning, the snow was higher than I'd ever seen before. There was no way our parents would be able to get back that day. In fact, it took them many days before they were able to. Fortunately, we didn't have any further problems during that time. My mom was kind of a witch when I was growing up, although I didn't really realize that at the time. She expected me to do a lot of things you probably shouldn't have a younger kid do. This is a story of something that happened one of the times she'd made me do this. We lived in a holler during this time period. It was a few miles away from her mother's trailer, which was the next house down the road. We didn't have a car, so whenever we went to see Grandma, we had to walk there. Grandma had a car and would take us into town whenever she needed to do it. 
This happened on a really cold and snowing winter night when I was about 10 years old. My mom was making something for dinner and she needed to have cornmeal to make cornbread. Our stepfather was a real asshole and for some reason he insisted on having cornbread with every meal. If he didn't get exactly what he wanted, he could get very violent. Even though it was late, dark, and cold, my mom sent me over to my grandma's house to grab some cornmeal. I got bundled up as best I could. We were so poor that we didn't have much, though. I went out into the cold and snow in order to grab that cornmeal. It was the coldest I had ever remembered it being in that area before. I had never felt anything like it. My poor clothing was hardly any sort of protection against these elements. It was snowing real hard, and it was hard to even move in all this snow. I was having a much more difficult time than usual trying to make this walk. It was the hardest I'd ever had to take, and I knew it was going to take forever as well. Because of this, I kept getting colder and colder. It wasn't very long before I actually began to get a little lightheaded too. I thought maybe it was too cold to be out in that weather and thought about turning back. I knew that if I did though, the wrath of my stepfather would be a whole lot worse than the cold. So I kept trudging onward. I kept feeling weaker and weaker, but I tried my best to make it to grandma's house where I knew I would be safe. The further I went though, the less it seemed I was going to be able to make it. At some point, my memory went blank. I remember walking in the cold, but it seems like everything just went dark at some point. I don't even remember exactly what point that was. Next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital. I was much warmer than I was before, but I didn't even remember being out in the snow immediately. It took me a while to remember very much of anything really. I guess I had passed out in the snow and fallen on the side of the road. If it hadn't been for a car happening to drive down that road and noticing me, even though I had been covered by snow by that point, I probably would have died that night. Fortunately, someone much kinder than my mom and stepfather noticed me, stopped the car and took me to the hospital. I recovered fully, but was treated like crap by my stepdad for quite a while for being too much of a wimp to make it to grandma's house. He used to mock me for it all the time. The story does have a happy ending though. The asshole accidentally killed himself while working on a car. I won't go into too much detail about that, but I think I gave you a good idea of what kind of man he was. No one really missed him all that much. I had just gotten out of high school and was cleaning out my closet a bit. I decided to post an ad on Craigslist. The title? Teen Girl Clothes for Sale. I did receive a few creepy messages, but nothing too scary. I needed the money real bad, so I waited a few days for a more serious buyer. And that's when an Annie emailed me. Her message said something along the lines of, Hey, can you meet me in the Walmart parking lot? I'd like to buy all of your clothes today. I was so eager to get rid of all this stuff, but I didn't want to go to a parking lot alone. I asked my mom to come with me, and she agreed. I let Annie know that I could meet sometime between 5 and 7. When she asked for my phone number, I gave it to her to facilitate easier contact. Back then, I gave my number to just about anyone who asked for it. I don't really do that so much these days. So, I'm texting this girl trying to arrange a time to meet when she tells me that she has to wait for her mom to get home from work so she can drive her to Walmart. I immediately felt a bit relieved. I was thinking to myself, okay, great. She's bringing her mom, I'm bringing mine, we're meeting in public. Surely all will be good. All was not good, of course. We agreed to meet up at 6.30 on the far right side of the parking lot. I was excited to get rid of all this old junk and get some fairly decent money, too. We headed to the side of Walmart, parked there, and waited. 
I texted her and let her know that we were already there. The first red flag to leave should have been her immediate reply. Are you alone? What kind of car are you driving? I told her and also let her know I was with my mom. There was no response to this. At this point, it was getting quite dark and I was looking around the parking lot to see if I could find her. That was when I spotted him. A young man not too much older than me in a white Nissan parked in the aisle before us, his window halfway down and staring directly at us. I asked my mom, Hey, you see that guy? Why is he staring? How much longer should we wait here for Annie? She casually glanced in his direction. Up to this point, we had both been on our phones not paying too much attention to anyone around us. I've since learned more about the term situational awareness. Pay attention to your surroundings, people. I figured she would text me when she was almost there, but there had been no further communication. So I called her. No answer. The man in the aisle over rolled down his window all the way, still staring, and started to blow bubbles. It was so weird, like actual bubble blowing. I could even see him holding the container, blowing these bubbles in our direction. He paused and smiled. Not a warm smile, but a sinister one. My mom and I took one look at each other, and I started the car. We began to put the pieces together, and we realized that this man in front of us was probably Annie. Not only did he have my phone number, but now he also knew my car's license plate number. I was trying my best not to freak out. He saw us pulling out of the parking lot and stepped out of his car. He stared us down while we hauled ass out of there. I was just praying he wouldn't try to follow us, and thankfully he did not. I guess seeing me with my mom threw him off. He thought I would be alone that night, and I'm grateful I wasn't. I blocked the number, and I never received further contact from Annie. Needless to say, I did not end up selling my clothes that day, and I have not been on Craigslist ever since. This happened about eight years ago in my local supermarket. I, female and 36 at the time, was in the queue to pay. It was Saturday morning, super busy, and I was second in line. In front of me at the till was a family of three, a mom, a dad, and a daughter. Mom and dad were unpacking the trolley, and the daughter was sitting in the trolley seat facing me. Behind me were these two men and they were making me super uncomfortable. They were standing way too close to me and not respecting my personal space at all. You know when you feel someone before you actually see them? It was kind of like that. I was facing the daughter and she looked super uncomfortable as well. She kept making herself smaller and looking over her shoulder to dad. I turned around and noticed these men were waving and smiling trying to get her attention. One guy even reached around me and grabbed her foot. He did it in such a familiar way that I thought he must have known the family. She flinched away though, and he tried to do it again. The girl quietly called for her father. The dad swung around and said in a booming voice something along the lines of, What the hell, dude? Don't touch my daughter. The weirdo just said, But we want to be friends with her. The dad said he didn't know them and to back off. I realized they didn't know each other at all and instantly went into mommy mode. The dad went back to unpacking the trolley, but this time I positioned myself between the two guys and the daughter, completely blocking access to her. Believe it or not, these two creeps were still trying to get her attention again, so this time I said really loudly, you're so lucky to have such a brave and strong dad. Look at how he's protecting you from these bad men. The dad looked at me and we had a silent conversation with our eyes. They packed up and left quickly. I thought it was over now. The girl was safe and I had to unpack my things and go home. As I was unpacking my trolley though, I suddenly noticed that one of the men had moved around and was standing at the end of the till staring at me with pure malice in his eyes. The other guy was still standing behind me. 
there was only my trolley between us. I won't lie, in that moment I did feel a bit intimidated. I'm not a small person by any means. I'm tall-ish with broad shoulders, and quite strong as well. In my trolley was 15 kilograms of dog food. My adrenaline was pumping. I needed to do something to show these guys I was not an easy target. I made eye contact with that aggressor at the end of the till and lifted up my bag of dog food like it was made of toilet paper. I did my best to not change my expression at all. I kept eye contact with him and flexed my muscles as well. Now I was angry. I paid and he tried to block my exit. I shoved my trolley right into him. He laughed menacingly and moved out of the way. I decided not to go straight to my car. I walked around the mall a bit. Every time I turned around, there they were, now with a third guy. They were not even hiding the fact they were following me at this point. One guy even made a motion of cutting my neck. At this point, I just started making my way to the security desk. When I got there, I turned around and they were gone. I told the security everything. They recommended I let the supermarket know as well. I gave them my till number so they could review the security tape above the till. A guard escorted me to my car. I drove home the long way, checking my rearview mirror constantly. I never saw them again, but to be honest, I stopped going to that supermarket after. Partly because of this incident, but mainly because their prices are not very competitive, and my dogs are very fussy eaters. So this happened about four years ago. My dad works nights, so I'm home alone until about 2.30 a.m. most days. We live in a pretty quiet area where people usually keep to themselves. One night, at around 1 in the morning, there was a sudden knock at the door. When I checked out my peephole, I could see there was a young woman with her car parked near the curb in front of my house. I answered, and she looked really young, just about 15 or 16, very youthful looking. In short, I didn't even know if she looked old enough to be driving. She told me she was having some car trouble and asked if I could come check it out for her and possibly give her car a jump. At this time, though, I didn't drive, have a car of my own, or know much about cars at all. I would be of little help in a situation such as this. I offered to call someone if she needed, though, AAA or even a tow service. She declined and kept insisting that I check out the lights on her dashboard to see if everything looked normal. At this point, I didn't want to go outside with a stranger, so I politely informed her I didn't think I could help her. I just had no knowledge of cars. I went back inside and kept looking out through the peephole. She opened the back door, got into the back seat, and the car drove off immediately. It instantly made my stomach drop and made me extremely freaked out. I was kind of distraught actually, thinking about what the real reason was to approach my house. Who was driving? The entire thing left me confused and frightened. I spent the next few days a little on edge. I was afraid they may return, knowing that someone was there or that I would be home alone. I also thought a lot about that girl and who she was. I wish I had a video doorbell at the time so I could find out if she was a victim or some sort of I don't know even. It still bothers me a lot and the whole encounter was eerie as hell. About two years ago, I was staying up late, around 2 a.m. or so when suddenly someone started knocking on my door and begging for help. I didn't answer because I'm a very petite woman and I don't really trust the people in my neighborhood. We have security cameras outside that see pretty much every angle outside of our house. I pulled up the app and could see it was a woman that was probably in her late 20s or early 30s. I didn't recognize her from around these parts, so I didn't answer. She kept knocking and asking for help, asking if anyone was home. Finally, she appeared to walk away. 
and then I heard the screen door under my carport open. She started knocking on that door and even jiggling the doorknob as well. At this point, I woke my husband up and he came to check out the situation. She was already gone by the time he got out there though. A few minutes later, she appeared again. First the front door, then trying the side door, then back again. This time, I just called the police, and an officer came out to speak with us and check the situation. He actually found her still there, hiding in some bushes just down the street. He said we were very wise not to open the door and let her in, because he recognized her, and she had a long list of priors for robbery and assault. This happened when I was 10 years old. I was at a ski resort with my dad, stepmom, and three sisters. When this happened, my two sisters, dad and stepmom, were all out skiing. Me and my sister Ava got cold though, so we went back to the hotel to get some food. We sat down at the restaurant inside until my stepmom came down. We asked her if she could hold the table for us so we could go up to the room quickly and drop off all our ski gear. We took the elevator and once we got off, we started the walk to our room. And that's when I heard someone behind me call out to us. Keep in mind, we were both 11 at the time, so I didn't really think he would be talking to us. We just sort of ignored him. We walked into our room, but before we could shut the door closed, a man stepped into the doorway. He was really tall, probably about six feet. He looked to be maybe in his early 60s or late 50s. He was wearing this hotel staff uniform, but something was wrong with it. It didn't appear to have all the logos it was supposed to. The thing that really raised a big red flag, though, was that he was wearing black surgical gloves for no reason. Hey, I was talking to you. We spun around, caught off guard. Us? Yeah, you. I was wondering if you could grab a pitcher for me and come to my room to pour some water. Our parents had told us never to trust strangers, and we were already getting a bad vibe from this guy. We tried to decline him. His tone then got very annoyed. Come on, it will take just a second. Come pour me some water in my room. At this point, we already knew this was not a right situation, so we said no again. This conversation went back and forth for about three minutes until he tried to force his way into our room. Our instincts kicked in at this point. I ran full speed towards the door and body slammed the door into him. Ava and I sat in the hotel room for about ten minutes panicking on how we were going to leave to tell our parents about this. We had left our phones downstairs with my stepmother. We looked at the people. The man was gone, so we bolted down the hallway and ran back down the stairs to the restaurant. Once we told our stepmom, she was mortified and went to office security. They interviewed us and asked for a description because they didn't have any cameras in the hallway. We gave them a description of the man, and they told us that nobody with that description even worked there, and most people were young, broke college students. At this point, it really set in that if we had tried to help him, we might have died or worse. 